Hello, my name is Jason Noble. I'm the lead pastor at First Assembly Church in St. Peter's, Missouri. I'm very excited to be able to share with you an incredible testimony of God's miraculous power. God is still in the miracle working business today. On January 19th, 2015, a young man, John Smith, who was 14 years old, fell through the ice. He was dead for over 45 minutes. The DVD you're about to watch is gonna share the incredible story of what happened. You're gonna hear from the doctors, you're gonna hear from the first responders, you're gonna hear from mom and dad, and you're gonna hear from John himself. It's exciting to see what God has done in just a very short amount of time. In fact, I would, to give you a brief overview of how this played out, John went into the hospital on Monday. He was airlifted to Cardinal Glennon on that Monday. By Wednesday, he was fully awake. Seven days from that, they were able to take the, the ventilator out of his mouth. Seven days from that point, he was sent home from the hospital. It's been incredible to watch this story play out. I'm very excited again that you are gonna be able to hear the story in its entirety. We honor first responders and we honor all that God has done. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the incredible story of John Smith. If you are a first responder, a doctor, a nurse, anyone that works in the medical professional, will you please stand? We wanna honor you. Just stand across this room, will you please? Fire department, ambulance, we have something we wanna put in your hands. All of our first responders, thank you for being here today. One of the goals of our service this morning was to thank our first responders. Another goal was to tell the story of John Smith in its entirety. And as you're looking at this story, you see just a tapestry of miracles that God has put together. We're also excited to have the, the Regard family with us. Josh was one of the boys. Josh, you're right down here. Um, we're glad that you're with us. Also, the Sander family, Josh and Josh. Will you guys please stand? We're so glad. And their families, will you stand? They were with them on the ice. We're so glad that you're here. You know what? I'm so thankful that we get to see three boys and their families, because it could have been a completely different story. And first responders, thank you for, uh, for all that you did um, in, in helping us. Doctors, thank you so much for all that you did. Uh, this morning, you really see just a tapestry of miracles that God put together with John. Yes, the medical professionals, they did an incredible job, and they partnered with God to see this play out. And this morning, I have a couple of verses that came to my mind. If we can pull the first one up, uh, that really speaks to one of the verses, Jeremiah 29, 11, And this was on a verse that we spoke over John the whole time that he was in the hospital. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Another promise that we have in scripture is that God heals. And if we can go to this next scripture, that would be great. James 5, 14 through 15. Are you hurting? Pray. Do you feel great? Sing. Are you sick? Call the church leaders together to pray and anoint you with oil in the name of the master. God is so good, isn't he? Believing prayer will heal you and Jesus will put you on your feet. And if you sin, you'll be forgiven, healed inside and out. What great scripture. Isn't it awesome to hear what Jesus wants to do? Pastor Josh, will you grab a couple guys and we'll bring these chairs forward? Could you help me with that? I'd appreciate it. As we look at this story play out with, with John and the boys, and we can go to the next slide because I think it's a great picture. This was a picture that was taken right before they went into the ice. And at 1155 on Martin Luther King Day, January 19th, 2015, but Joyce and the other moms would get a call that their sons had gone under the water. And it was very, very, very scary to know that John was without oxygen for 15 minutes under the water. And we're going to hear from the doctors and the nurses that kind of helped with this process. And this morning, we have the ER doctor with us, Kent Sutterer. Will you come, Kent? Well, no, just thank you so much for being here. I'd like to hear just your side of the story. And I know that you wrote an incredible letter. I know our congregation would love to hear. What did you see? What happened after 15 minutes? And I think I jumped over it, didn't I? Because I should have had Tommy. So Tommy, why don't you come up too? Where's Tommy Shine? Uh, Tommy, come on up. If you want to bring your guys, come on. Yeah, come on guys.
You may be seated, thanks. Are we good keeping you guys okay back here? All right, perfect. I love this background, it's great. It wasn't even planned. <laughs> Tommy was, and the men and women here were the first ones on the scene at the ice. And Tommy, will you share what, what happened and what you guys came upon? Absolutely. First off, I'd like to say thank you to Lake San Luis Fire District. They were the first guys on the scene. Firefighter Man. Joe, Firefighter Terra Nova, and Captain Justin Darnell. These were the first guys to entry. Okay, and then uh, 9814 out of Winsville Fire District Station number one is a fire truck that I am on. We were responding from Deerbergs in downtown Winsville. We heard the call go out, immediately begin to get dressed by direction of Captain Max Mueller. We arrive on scene and make contact with Firefighter Morrow and Firefighter Terra Nova, who were already in the water searching. At that point, uh, Captain Darnell, along, along with Jeremy from SCAD Ambulance, was there and giving us direction. And also, thank you to the gentleman from the St. Louis, Lake St. Louis Association. It was because of their efforts and early notification of 911 that we're here today. Because they were quick and easy, and they made it happen. And that gentleman stayed there the whole time, giving us direction and guidance on where we should be searching. And it's resilient. Every one of these men and women are resilient. You guys are resilient for what you've done, and that's why we're here. Basically, for us, we arrived, and the chief from Winsville Fire District, Chief Mike Marlowe, ordered us to bring two long-reaching devices to the water. I took those and handed one of them to Firefighter Morrow. We began searching, and then that's when we'll go. We're going to call it what it is. The miracle on ice happened. I had the opportunity to find John with the assistance of Firefighter Morrow. We were able to pull that young man out who was lifeless. I mean, it's a harsh reality. He was lifeless. And once we notified the land support team that we had the young man, they pulled him in, and then that's when Kenny Ambulance and them, they're resilient, just effortless. They knew exactly what to do right when that young man got on. And it was all hands on deck. And we like to call it in our world, organized chaos. It looked completely chaotic. That's like church, too. But, <laughs> but everybody knew the responsibility, and it wasn't minutes before they had that young man in the hospital in route to the hospital and that's when the miracle continues the doctors i mean the staff that you guys have phenomenal most importantly the church family you guys never stop praying or giving up for that young man pastor dason mom and dad everyone that was there for him that's what you guys pat yourselves on the back you're the ones who continue this miracle on ice as we call it and again these guys and gals Resilience, that's what causes what we do. At the end of the day, do we expect to find him? Absolutely not. You hope for the best, you train as hard as you can, but you never really expect it to happen until it does. And then for me, it's amazement and shock and all. That's how you describe it. No one expected it to happen. So what happened on Saturday before this event? So we were doing ice rescue training because we were, certi we were required to maintain a certification and we were supposed to do training. So we'd already been in the suits prior to that. In the lake guys we do a lot we're very close to lake st louis district so we do a lot of cross training and that's what makes us even more successful because they kind of knew each of us were kind of prepared to know what we had to do right then firefighter model very knowledgeable of the water and he was able biggest thanks to him because he told me right when i got in he goes you're going to know the difference between a rock and something else and that's what made me decide that when i touched it the first time i didn't realize apparently then i touched the young man again and said i think i got him and just started pulling up and that's when I notified him, and here we are so today. So what happened in the water? The water, it was when just you were out there. the direction. Someone was, somehow, some way, I was there for a reason, along with Firefighter Morrow. He was a foot and a half away from where I found John. It could have easily been Firefighter Morrow. No one knows. It's, again, that's the uncertainty, but again, the miracle as to why I was able to find him when I did and as quickly as we did. And I think you had said that a voice or something that spoke to you about moving two feet over. The direction, right. For some reason, the direction put me where I was. Because, I mean, we had no idea, really. We had a general area. And, again, you just hope. Yeah. It's all about the blessing and the miracle. I was talking to one of the other first responders that said the lake is about 50 to 60 feet. He was 150 feet offshore. So, typically, in that lake, it was about 50 to 60 feet deep and muddy. Uh, is what the first responder had said where John happened to go down. It was 10 feet deep around, I think they said. Correct. And it was in rock. Correct. And that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? I mean, just that tapestry of miracles coming Absolutely. together. And the knowledge you guys had of the that. The knowledge, yes, of all the men that were on, the women that were on. Uh, do you have anything else you, you'd like to add? How long was he underwater? 
We've determined, Chief, if you want to help me here correctly, um, 13 minutes approximately is what, but from the time that I made entry to the time I, that we notified shore support that we had him. So 13 minutes from the time that I made entry, so we're talking in excess of 15 to 17. If Lake St. Louis Police Department is not up here, they were the first ones there. Yeah, they so they, they were resilient in their efforts as well. I mean, those guys went out, wouldn't even think twice. They didn't have any of the equipment that the fire personnel had. So thank you to those guys who put their lives out there first. Yeah, the officer coming down was the first one in the water, actually. share what you had said so that everyone can hear on Chief Marlowe. Uh, yes, when the call comes in, it comes into our 911 dispatch center. So credit goes to them also. We have a fine group of dispatchers in St. Charles County. The 911 caller gave the information to dispatch and dispatch does what we call a size up. And basically when we're in route, they tell us what to expect before we get there and that helps a lot. But if we're talking time under the water, we're talking at least 13 to 15 minutes from the time our firefighters entered the water, an additional four minutes probably prior to that. So a uh, considerable amount of time actually under the water for this, uh, this to have occurred. And, and the outcome, um, Firefighter Shine said it so very well. Everybody has a part, we're a team. But there was, been in this business 38 years, and I will tell you there's divine intervention. This was divine intervention, and I, I, I really believe that. Chief, with your experience, what would have you thought the outcome was gonna be? On this call, what were you thinking? The one child that self-rescued, obviously, we knew he would be fine. The other child that Lake St. Louis rescued, we knew would be fine. Um, but the child that was submerged for up to 20 minutes, um, that, that one does not normally turn out the way it did. And that's where I call the divine intervention. It started on the lake, it continued with the paramedics, it continued at St. Joe's West, and it continued at Cardinal Glennon. And I, I truly believe that. Man, thank you so much. Can we give our first responders another hand? So appreciate it. Thank you, guys. What a moving, and that's only the first part. <laughs> so doctor, what did you see when he showed up in your emergency room? When John, you know, when John arrived by EMS, um, already had a breathing tube down his throat. Uh, he was cold and you know, lifeless. Uh, I believe his temperature when he came in was 88 degrees. Um, and you know, we immediately went to work, knowing that this is a grave, grave situation. I mean, it, uh, actually, I didn't know he was underwater that long. I had heard 10 minutes, so. Um, but it was another 10, 15 minutes transit time. Um, so he, he had already been dead for 20, 25 minutes by the time he got to my shop. Um, and I just wanna, I wanna, Thank Alex and Keith and Dr. Bauer and everybody that was in the room at, at West. Um, we had an, an exceptional um, code response in this in this instance. Even though you know, I thought it was for no reason. Uh, this is what we, in a lot of instances, call a practice case because you, you don't expect any you know any return to life. Um, so we were doing CPR, uh, giving him lots of warm fluids. We had him in a, a bear hugger, which is like a, a, a blow dryer to try and warm his body up. 
um, because there's an old saying in emergency medicine, they're not dead until they're warm and dead. Um, and we were able to get his body temperature up to uh, 90, about 95 degrees. Um, and I remember another doctor who was in the room with me, um, she said, you know, what's your goal temperature? I mean, you know, what is warm and dead? So basically so we could pronounce him dead. Um, and I said, this is it. I mean, it's, he's up to 95. I doubt he's going to get any warmer. And you know, he's, he has shown absolutely no signs of coming back. Um, And that's, at that point, we like to call the parents in um, because the, the, the act of CPR is one of the most brutal things that you can do to a person. We had our gigantor Keith over there pounding on his chest. <laughs> I, and, uh, you know, we were you know, putting tubes in here and there, and um, I brought... Joyce in just I, I wanted her to see everything that we were doing and that it was not having any effect um, you know he was gone and I was getting ready to kneel down next to her and say you know, I'm sorry your son passed away um, but when she came in the room it's it, it still just leaves me it's indescribable. I, I don't have words for what happened at that point. She started praying, and she started praying loudly. People <laughs> on the other side of the emergency department. I just want to stay standing. <laughs> I know Heather was outside the room and she heard the same thing. From outside the room, uh, Joyce crying out to God uh, with the specific request, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to save my son. And unexplicably, that's when his heart started again. And yeah, probably the biggest question I've gotten asked since all of this has transpired is, was this a miracle? You know, I hear everybody say, well, the cold water saved him. How many minutes was this, by the way, at this time? He, he had been getting CPR for about 43 minutes. Under the water, probably an additional 20. So nearly an hour maybe more than an hour. Um, so you know, people say, well, you know, was it the cold water that saved him? Um, yeah, I'm not an expert on miracles. I'm an expert on emergency medicine. People don't come to me for miracles. They come for me for emergency Maybe medicine. they will now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's, that's not going to go on my card. We could work together. <laughs> And, you know, my, I'm, you know, but my job here is just, to, just to, to lay the facts out. I mean, the experts on miracles can look at all of these time stamps and how long that John was underwater and how long he was pulseless. And I don't think that there's any doubt. Um, it, it, and even with the fact that his heart came back, I, you know, I, I, I was thinking to myself, I changed the place where he's going to die. I thought he'd go to see Dr. Garrett and he would die at Cardinal Glenn and ICU. Um, for him to have a, a total recovery uh, and not you know, you know, some seizure activity or some brain damage or anything like this, total recovery, it, it is, 
It, it's unbelievable. It's miraculous. I mean, you just, it just doesn't happen like that. Um, and the fact that it happened at the very moment uh, when his mother was crying out in prayer, I mean, that right there, it just... I, I wish everybody could have been there at that moment just to see what happened. I mean, it, you, you just can't explain it. There is no explanation. Um, and I, I keep, you know, I meet people that, who, that were there or that were, were in close proximity, and I, you know, I share with them my recollection, which I wrote down the night after it happened. Um, and by the way, I wrote that down uh, as a counsel to his classmates, because I didn't think he was going to make it, and I wanted them to know what, what happened. Um, and I, I show them the, you know, the way I remember it. And they said, yeah, that, that's it, that's how it happened. I mean, there was, there was yeah, no controversy in the, the sequence of events. Um, if we would put it into a medical algorithm, we'd say, you know, um, patient's dead, mother prayed, patient came back to life. I mean, it, <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. Can we give Dr. Kent a hand? So appreciate it. <laughs> Dr. Garrett, will you come join me on stage? At that moment, they life-flighted John to Cardinal Glennon. And I got to tell you, Cardinal Glennon has been an incredible partner. SSM has been a, an incredible partner in all of this, even setting up today. Um, we appreciate you guys so much. Thank you so much for all that you've done. And I love this. I love the word, this mission statement of Cardinal Glennon. Through our exceptional health care services, we reveal the healing presence of God. And that is what they did. That's what they did. From the moment that we uh, showed up on the scene, uh, John, his mom, thankfully his mom didn't get an accident driving from St. Joseph's to, uh, uh, to down to Cardinal Glennon, but we were there about two hours after, and I had just a great pleasure to meet Dr. Garrett, who is one of the pediatricians that works in the PICU, um, and also I found out was listed as a 2014 Doctor of the Year. I was impressed that he was on the way. That's good. Awesome. So when you ran into John, what did you think? What, where, where were you at? I know we were on this long process journey together. Tell us the story. Well, um, I'll answer that question in a second, but I first just want to say that I too truly am impressed and here to honor the first responders because without them, Dr. Souter and myself would have never had an opportunity to meet John. So thank you. Several things had to go right, and several people had to do beyond an incredible job for him to get to where he was. Dr. Souter had um, recanted how he didn't expect John to make it out of the emergency room. And then when Joyce had come in and prayed, miraculously his heart beat started. But at that point, if you heard what he's saying, Dr. Souter still didn't expect John to survive. And his eyes started to hear about this tragic accident that had happened and all the, the, the circumstances that surrounded it. Medically, our hopes were not high. But this, this is a miraculous story uh, of a miraculous gift from our Heavenly Father to a young man, a 14-year-old boy named John Smith. And it's a story that many would choose not to believe when they first hear it, but nonetheless, it's true. Hearing that a young man was on his way, being transported, that he'd been under the water for somewhere 10, 20 minutes, CPR in progress, 43 minutes, eight epinephrine doses, in a heartbeat had come back, lab work showing a terribly low body pH, massive metabolic acidosis, 
and no signs of neurologic function at that time. Really, all those things said John wasn't going to make it. Hypothermia was perhaps the one thing that might be on his side, but even that, you can check the medical literature, you find only case reports of survival, and even then, not with these factors. John first arrived at Cardinal Glennon, and the first sign of neurologic activity of any type that was found was some rudimentary breathing, but not breathing like you might think that would support regular life, just agonal breathing, low primitive effects of the brain stem. But along with this terrible neurologic devastation, his lungs were just filling with fluid, not fluid from the lake, but fluid from his own body from the inflammation and welling up with blood stained fluid out of his lungs up into tracheal tube something we call massive pulmonary edema. His heart was still needing continuous adrenaline infusion to be supported in his cardiovascular system. His gastrointestinal tract had, was failing, um, ready to produce voluminous diarrhea. His muscles were breaking open. His blood coagulation system was set off and disrupted. His white blood cells that fight infection were being consumed faster than they could be produced and becoming what we call neutropenic. There really were just a host of medical signs that said he was in multi-system organ failure with minimal to any neurologic function and that this was unlikely to have a good outcome. We continued to care for him and um, did a variety of additional things of uh, putting in monitors for beat to beat measurement of his blood pressure and the like and look for more of a response and we were seeing, weren't seeing it. Can I step in for just a second? Because at this point, Joyce came out and told, I'm going to show the spiritual side as he's talking about the medical side, because we really were kind of partners. I mean, we, you know, I didn't do much. I just stood and prayed, but um, we did pray. And at that moment, Joyce came out and she said that John only has brainstem function. And so there was three of our pastors there and two other pastors. So we had a total of six pastors in the room. And we said, you know what, we're going to go in and we're going to begin to pray. We're going to begin to call out on God. This was about two hours after it happened. And we went in and we just began to pray over him. Um, and as we prayed, I turned around and I saw two angels in the room that were at the back of the room that were just standing. I felt like God was saying, listen, I've got this. I've got it under control. You be, just continue to pray. And at that moment, I saw his eyes pop open. And he kind of squeezed my hand. And I go, okay, we're going to continue praying. We're not going to let this guy go. And about 15 minutes later, we just started praying that God's breath would just, because we knew it was his brain and his lungs, we began to just pray, Lord, put the breath back in his lungs, just that raised, just like what raised Adam out of the ground, just like what uh, the, the creative power where God created the heavens and the earth and uh, what he did there. And at that moment, I was right down by John's head. And I saw just beams of, of light coming down from heaven. And the best way I could explain it is God was just like going, zzz, zzz, just putting it back together again. And at that moment, after we began to pray, Pastor Brad Riley was with me at that moment. At that very moment, right after that, John's eyes opened. He kind of came off the, off the gurney. And man, I just saw life at that point. And I knew God, I mean, he had a long haul, but that was the beginning of what God was going to do. And it was incredible because we started to see, I mean, at that moment, then past that, you know, you started to see improvement. What blew me away about the whole process is there, and you might know better than me, but it seemed like there was literally no setbacks along the way. I mean, there was maybe here and there, but not big, you know, because we, we kind of expected the big stuff. And it seemed like, man, God just opened the door. Great care. God took care of things. Uh, it was, it was great. Well, what he says is true. Um, <laughs> But uh, we, we wish we could have just relaxed right away, but um, there was a lot more to happen that week. Um, but the, uh, as I met with Joyce and uh, John uh, Sr. Um, and explained what we were seeing that first moments before this event happened, I told him I, I really didn't have high hopes that he very likely two expectations were to happen. Maybe a miracle might come to pass, but medically, we expected that he would either go on to brain death 
or if he were able to survive, be severely neurologically impaired. Now then, at that point, I began to see Joyce's unshakable faith. And I told her, doctors can be wrong and will be wrong, and I wanted to be proved wrong. Perhaps John was listening. <laughs> um, the, uh, I heard uh, reports that his eyes had opened um, before I left late that evening and uh, found it hard to believe. Went back to the room and uh, they weren't open anymore, but there were a few more signs of brainstem function. And we were looking for those to continue to show steady progress. The next day, uh, John was showing some signs more of progress. We were still keeping his body cooled on purpose to about the temperature Dr. Suter talked about, trying to use hypothermia to an advantage, let the rest of his body recover before the brain was asked to start functioning fully metabolically. And we saw some signs. Um, one thing that I found somewhat amazing, is we were trying to get him to see if he could obey commands or the like. And the biggest response I saw after trying for about five, 10 minutes to see a response is when mom came to the bedside and we saw his right hand move up when asked. Um, it wasn't something we could get him to do reproducibly, but it sure happened. Uh, then um, still we were, were thinking that perhaps we're, he's gonna survive, but we were still not reassured that he was gonna be normal like he is. And the, the third day, um, Pastor Rob had been there, nearly continuous, singing even some of the songs you heard this morning. That's me, Pastor Jason. Yeah, I'm sorry, That's okay. Pastor Jason. No problem. It was uh, a long week. There were a number of pastors there, yes. but Pastor Jason was the one pretty much inseparable from John. And um, the, uh, he told me, well, he's responding more. And I thought, really? Yeah, he can answer questions. Ask him about basketball. And he told me about John's uh, special um, feelings regarding Michael Jordan and uh, LeBron James. And um, it was an amazing neurologic exam. Well, John, <laughs> John didn't uh, respond to a lot of things. He uh, could lift his right hand in favor of things that said Michael Jordan and his left hand in favor of things that said LeBron James and answer all the questions the way the family told me. Um, even which one was his favorite. <laughs> um, and I wish it was just smooth sailing from there, but John, the rest of John's body was having a hard time keeping up with his brain. And his lungs were very sick. I forgot to mention that that first night, even with the ventilator on high settings and special other therapies, we couldn't get oxygen to a normal level in John's blood. His lungs were just that inflamed. And we even thought about putting him on continuous cardiac bypass but he didn't seem to be a good candidate for that at the time. And uh, the lungs, they, we continued to beat the lungs with ventilator with extreme force to the point that in uh, around the third day, they began to leak air out into his tissues, up his neck, making him look swollen. Rice Krispies. Pastor Jason knows it, uh, it, air under the skin felt like crunchy packing material. And that air extended in through his chest cavity, making breathing and ventilation with the ventilator difficult, even down into his abdominal cavity. But John's body was able to recover from that. His muscles continued to leak out enzymes and their proteins into the bloodstream that then continued to be filtered by the kidney and risk kidney failure. But still, John's body was getting through this. His neurologic status, though, um, took a little bit of a setback. We were having to give sedation for John because of terrible coughing spells that interfere with ventilation. And um, we began to worry that he wasn't as responsive as he was to where on the Saturday, we did another CAT scan of his head to look for any structural changes that had happened we didn't know. And also uh, a spinal tap, a removal of spinal fluid to look for infection, meningitis, because his body continued to have severe, terrible spiking fevers from all this inflammation. But that too began to pass, and uh, as he got into near a week out, it was clear that John was back, his neurologic status was strong, and he was uh, working to get off the ventilator, um, which then fighting happened. Fighting to get off the ventilator. <laughs> fighting, fighting was a good word, because um, unless we kept him sedated after the first couple days, uh, he just, it was 
voracious coughing fits that uh, John's body just did not want to have what was going on. What did you, I find one thing interesting that you had said during the process that in his lungs you expected to find infection. What did you find? The cultures of his lungs didn't grow anything. And that is astonishing because when we take cultures of the, the secretions in the lungs in just about anybody on the ventilator, it at least grows some bacteria. In John's case, nothing. Pretty awesome. I love the timeline. We took some pictures of the timeline. This was about three days in. If we can get that up on the screen back there, guys. And so by that following Wednesday, he was off the ventilator. A couple days past that, we have the next picture where his team was around him. And then by, that would have been, I think, that Monday, somewhere around in there. By Wednesday, this is what he looked like. That was uh, a, that Wednesday afternoon when we were walking out, we got him broken out, and then the final picture uh, when we were leaving the hospital. Two and a half weeks. What do you think about that? This, um, I've been criticized by some in the internet for using the word miracle. They say I should know better because I'm a doctor. We're behind you 100%. But I, you know, I, I firmly believe that Jesus performed many miracles when he was here on earth, that the Bible details some of them. There have been miracles since. And what happened in this case, John Smith himself is a miracle. Yeah. I think another interesting fact I'd heard was that, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, but you're an expert on drowning? Um, it is one of my interests, and I've been asked to lecture on it a number of times, and also, coincidentally, on hypothermia. So, he's the doctor that John gets when he walks in the door at Cardinal Glendon. A tapestry of miracles. Dr. Garrett, thank you so much for being here today. Can we give him a hand? So appreciate you. Brian and Joyce and John, will you guys come on? I want to, want to just welcome them to the stage. Can we give them a hand, Brian, Joyce, and John? You might need two. I think we need some Kleenex up here. Joyce, talk to us. Is this on? I apparently don't need this because from what I understand, I can talk very loud. <laughs> and I will tell you this, I have no memory of being that loud. <laughs> I thought I was being very sedate and uh, collected. Apparently not. <laughs> I just want to say that we serve a God that can do the impossible. I don't know, where do you begin? From God starting with cold water retrieval training with our fire department the day before, the week before, is that a coincidence? No from going into the hospital with a doctor whose son or who da whose daughter was in my son's class. Is that a coincidence? No. 
God put together everybody that he needed in the order that he needed them to perform this miracle. And it, the miracle isn't about us. The miracle is about what God is capable of doing. And that's what this is about. Dr. Sutter talked about Keith, the young man who was doing CPR on my son. And by the way, I didn't know about that mental preparing <laughs> that you talked about at that time. It wasn't even on my scope of something that was going to happen. I just knew that my son needed something and he needed it very quickly. And when I walked into the room and I saw Keith crushing my son, I thought, oh my goodness, they have gone through the hospital and got the biggest dude here to come in here <laughs> and press on my son's chest. But, you know, that's a miracle also because I know just from knowledge that a lot of times CPR is such a vicious thing that they do to you that it breaks your bones. And John had none of that. Again, God's miracle. I remember a very sweet little nun that had to come in and sit down in the room with me and she was had her arm on my shoulder and she was praying with me again put there perfect she was just precious I have no idea who she is or what her name was but I know that she was sent there to be with me because she just really kept me calm through the thing and I remember going in and sitting in the room and I Time started to sense, just sit still for me at that point in time. It, it was like, I, you know, minutes didn't matter anymore. And I remember watching them and thinking, Lord, I, j I need you right now. I need you more than anything right now. And at that point in time, Dr. Sutter told me, he said, you can go up and talk to your son, having no idea that he was getting ready to give me some really bad news. <laughs> That didn't even know that until Tuesday when I read his letter after the accident. But I remember walking up and the only part of John that wasn't covered was his feet. And I remember looking down at them and they were very gray. And when I touched them, they were very cold. And I knew at that point in time, I needed to be desperate with my God. And so I guess my volume level must have come up a lot. <laughs> I just remember that I knew that I had to get a hold of God and get a hold of him fast. And so I just remembered we were studying in our Bible study. And this, again, it's not something that wasn't preordained. We were studying Beth Moore's Bible study, Believing God. And one of the things on there, it says, the first, I believe God can do, is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. And that's the very thing that came through my mind. And so I just started calling on the Holy Spirit because I knew that the Holy Spirit had rise, raised Christ Jesus from the dead and that the power that was there. And so I just started saying, Holy Spirit, I need you right now to come and to come and breathe life back into my son. And I don't know how it was at seconds, minutes, whatever. I just remember somebody saying, we've got a pulse, we've got a pulse. Well, at that time, to me, the work was done. <laughs> I had no idea all the things that the doctors had said here and described today were going on. In my mind, God had finished the work, and I was just going from there. And so we beat the hospital, we beat the helicopter to the hospital. And so when we got in there, you know, I'm still praying, you know, Lord, do, do your thing, you know, and just everything was going to be okay in my mind at that point in time. It was, it was going to be okay. And so when we went in and had the discussion with Dr. Garrett, I, w I don't mind telling you, I was not happy. <laughs> In fact, I was a little mad. <laughs> and when Dr. Garrett explained to me what the possibilities for my son was, I thought, okay, this is it. I, I, I can't hear anymore. And so I believe my words to him were, okay, you do what you do best and my God will do the rest. I had no idea that he had a faith in God. 
I had no idea that Dr. Sutter had a faith in God. But once again, God had put the right people together at the right time, at the right place. And this whole tapestry was being woven together for a praise of what God's abilities are and who he is. And I remember Jason came in and he told me, he said, you know, the Lord has told me that he wants me to come here and be here until he releases me. How do you feel about that? And I thought, my thought at that time was, well, okay, I, I'm good with that. I, I can take that. <laughs> you know, I, I'll do that. And then I was sitting there and I thought to myself, you know, this is going to be a miracle. And I want him to be able to tell this from a first person perspective and not something that was reported to him second-handedly. In fact, Jason knows things about this that I don't because I was not in the room with a lot of time because there were so many pastors <laughs> in their praying that I would leave and slip out because of how many people were in there. And to be real honest with you, even though I knew God had done a great thing and was doing a great thing, it was very hard to sit there and look at your son when there was tubes coming out of every orifice of his body and to see his eyes and his face and his chest swollen the way it was, it was, it was not an easy thing to do. And so I would take breaks from that. And Jason would, and Brad Riley and Mark uh, Shepard and Al Edney, uh, one of John's friends, who's a pastor at Willett Road Church, would come in tirelessly and pray over John day after day. And as we, each day as we saw the things that were happening that were just phenomenal. I know one of the, I remember some of the things that Dr. Garrett told me would happen that his brain would swell possibly, that he would have seizures, that there would be bacteria in his lungs, all these things. And yet those things never happened. God each day would take care of the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And we started to do this. I told Jason and I told Melissa Fisher who stayed with me many nights at the hospital that we're not going to speak negative there will be no negative proverbs 21 or 1821 says that from our mouth we have we hold the power of life and death in our mouth and we will eat of the fruits of it and we are eating out of the fruits of those right now because we kept things positive. I learned that from a very good friend of mine who's sitting out here in the congregation, Leslie Calloway, used to tell me all the time, the power of life and death is in your tongue. And she learned it from her mother. And it's just, when you start understanding the powers of your words, we just learned in Beth Moore's Bible study that God is omnipotent. And because we are created in his image, our words are potent. You have to think about that for a minute. Our words are potent, and how we use them is important. We can use them to the negative, or we can use them to the positive. That's our choice, and we chose to do the positive, that we were only going to speak life into John. And when you do that, you know, I can tell you this for a fact, and, and this is something Beth Moore said in our Bible study. Again, not an accident that we were doing this time. I didn't get to do several of those lessons, but Melissa and Carrie assured me <laughs> that I was getting to live them. But <laughs> I was going to say, you got to live the lesson. <laughs> I got to live the lesson. Sometimes it's fun to do the lesson, and sometimes the field trip isn't exactly fun. <laughs> It was funny. We were talking, and one of the things, you know, one of my things that I say is, Lord, you drive and I'll ride. <laughs> Joyce said, I never knew what that meant until this experience right here. <laughs> he would get up and make an altar call, and at the end, and this is when he first came here, and, you know, you critique, you critique your new pastor. Everybody knows that. <laughs> and he would say that, and I keep thinking, that is the strangest thing I have ever heard at an altar call. But I've tell you what, I've got to live it. And I want God to drive all the time. <laughs> but I go on to say this. God is the God of the impossible. My friend Leslie and I were talking about this yesterday. How do you judge somebody's miracle? How do you rate it from 1 to 10? 
To that person that needs that miracle at that time, to them it's always a 10, no matter where it is, whether it's your son being raised from the dead, whether your finances need to be taken care of, whether somebody needs healing, whether your marriage needs to be healed, whether your mind is having problems, you're having depression, no matter what your problem, your miracle that you need to you, it's always a 10 when God comes in and takes care of it. And so, you know, how do you rate this? I can't rate this other than to tell you that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is nothing gone on through this that is anything short of miraculous in the hand of God. Amen. So, Brian, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, we've congratulated a lot of people today, but one of the things I'd like to say is and I think it's miraculous, is the way the prayer network went out. With social media and stuff the way it is today, I, I'm not a Facebook person, so I don't even engage in it. But we were hearing from all over the place, from even in Europe and Central America, people that were praying for John. And it's like dominoes. Once it started, it just kept going. And you, you could talk to anyone. And we, I had family members who were working over in Illinois and they said people were coming up to them multiple times a day asking for reports. So the people, any of our friends and church family that were praying for John, we thank you because you had a part in his continuing improvement. We, we really never did have any steps backwards. I have to say one thing too, if anybody in this church wondered about Pastor Jason, if you could have seen the yeoman work that he did sitting by John's bed until one in the morning sometimes and coming back the next day early, he, he camped out. I, I asked him about it, and that's what he said. He said he felt the Lord had told him to pitch a camp. And he knew stuff, as Joyce said, that we didn't because he was there to talk to the doctor sometimes. And we just can't thank him enough for all the hours that were put in because somebody had to be there to anchor things, and you did an amazing job. Thank you for the opportunity. I could sit here for an hour and a half and go through the things that God has done and the things, the miracle that he has performed. But the prayer thing, the prayer thing, that was unbelievable. People still come up to me. We were at the doctor's office on Thursday and a lady walked in and I'm tired at this point in time and I've seen cameras and I've talked to people and after a while you start, you know, faces start just kind of fading in and out. And there was a lady standing up at the front of the line at the doctor's office. And when we walked in, she's, oh, hi, how are you? You know, and how are you, John? And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't have a clue who this lady is. And she obviously knows me. And I'm thinking, oh, please, Lord, do not let her come back and talk to me because I'm going to be in so embarrassed when I don't know who she is. So sure enough, here she comes from the line comes back to where I am and starts talking to me and she goes, I know you don't know me, but I want you to know this. I lived right across the street from where John was pulled out of the water and when I came out and saw it, I knew it was desperate and I'm a believer and I want you to know that I went back in and got on my knees and started intercessory prayer for John. My, son, uh, have, my sons have a friend who lives in Germany. His name's Nico. And Nico was raised behind the Iron Curtain and raised in communism and didn't believe in God. And he's come over here a lot to visit us. And he's been in my home. And we've talked about God. And he just doesn't believe that there is a God. And so Tom texted him to tell him what had happened to John. And he loves John. And he texted him back and he said, I have never prayed to a God before, but I prayed. And I have chicken skin, which is his word, German word for goosebumps, that God, God reaches out across an ocean to someone to let him know that he's there and he's real. Amen. Thank you, Joyce. John, what do you think about all this? This thing on. Oh. Okay. Well, 
Um, I don't remember anything as I'm just the one that goes with the flow. <laughs> that was kind of our fault too. We prayed that you wouldn't remember anything and he doesn't. But um, waking up, uh, I've told multiple people. I remember waking up and first person I see is uh, my sister Ari. Um, her holding my hand. Just letting me know I'll be all right. And then seeing Mama Fisher and my mom. I was scared. I didn't know what was going on until I woke up one night and um, I pulled the feeding tube out. Thought it was a booger. <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> but uh, waking up and seeing Ari there meant a lot. And uh, Mama Fisher sitting by me just praying for me, telling me I'll be all right. Everybody from school, Mrs. Bennis, uh, my friends that are sitting in the front here, they always stood by me. <laughs> my mom, my dad, my brothers. Pastor, all the pastors, even Pastor Mark. Just, I couldn't do it without my family. And the Lord, of course, but I think you put the people in my life for reasons. And I thank him for that. I couldn't ask for a better set of family in my life than the people I have now. So I thank each and every one of you for your prayers. I think the Heroes over here for saving me, for not giving up. <clears throat> and I just thank the Lord for my life. God has an incredible plan and purpose for you, John. Bringing you from Guatemala when you were just a baby. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in your life. It's awesome. Do you have Jason, anything else you want to add? Yeah. Jason, I, I just like to say, you know, God doesn't save people halfway. And he didn't cure John halfway. The other night he was in the backseat of the car with one of his friends and they were texting and talking about girls and listening to music. And it was so normal. It didn't take the girl part out. God, uh, that's all returned. But it, it just, it was, it was like a day three months ago. And to, for him to go in and out of the hospital, Dr. Garrett talked about how grave all his bodily functions were. And 16 days after he went under the water in a frozen lake at Lake St. Louis, he's walking out under his own steam. I don't know how anybody can say that's not a miraculous thing and that the, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. End of statement. I would like to also thank somebody that behind the scenes and behind the man, and that's Paula Noble, to give up her husband for the many hours that she did and his children for him to be able to come and minister to us. And for even Paula, she came up to the hospital and helped me get through a couple rough moments. It's an incredible woman and supportive of her husband and very happy to have her as first lady of our church. What an incredible morning, huh? We're going to close by going to the Lord in prayer and just thank God for what he's done. Thank you for watching the incredible story of John Smith, a story that proves that God is still in the miracle business today. Really a tapestry of miracles when you look at this young man 
who was lifeless for 45 minutes without a pulse. God raised him up from the dead. You heard the incredible, the prognosis from the doctors and the first responders, the fact that there would be many, many months of rehabilitation according to what they thought. And the fact of the matter is that God intervened and did an incredible miracle. To give you an update on John, John, a couple weeks after he got out of the hospital, was released from the neurologist, never to have to come back again. He was released from physical therapy a couple weeks after that, and now is back out on the basketball court with no sign of any issue. It's been incredible to watch this play out. If you're needing a miracle today, I wanna to assure you that God is in the miracle working business. John is just one of many miracles that we've seen at our church. When we face impossibilities, that's when God is able to step in. And today, if you're needing God to step in, I can assure you, he is still in the miracle working business today. We wanna to pray with you. When we pray, we see God show up. There's a number on your screen. If you wanna give us a call and you need somebody to pray with you, we'd be glad to do that. Thanks again for watching. Let's believe God for incredible things. God bless you.